Good afternoon. This is Q&A with Dima. It's my program, Transformation, Art of Reinvention in the Time of the Pandemic. Now with Steven Isserles, who is my neighbor. We literally live about five minute walk from each other. And we take walks now in this pandemic. So we see each other more often than normal. And it's a great pleasure to welcome Steven here. It's really a great treat. I'm looking forward to our program. Thank you. So let me ask you, of course, I mean, the, the obvious question would be that you've probably never been at home as long as the last year. Now it's been more than a year. So is, is there anything that's changed in your life and any positive things that you've learned about yourself, you've accomplished, or what would you, uh, if you look back a year, what, what has it been? I don't think I've learned anything about myself, but then I never do. Um, <laughs> but I have learned a few pieces I probably wouldn't have learned otherwise. Definitely, in fact. And I've written a book that I wouldn't have written. I was I thought of writing it, but I never would have done it. But because I had all this time, I could do it because it was a very time-consuming book to write, even though it's only about 200 pages. It took a long, lot of research, a lot of time, about the Bach Suites. Yeah. So. The Bach Suites, the, the Bible, the Cello Bible, the equivalent of Cello Bible, because we have our own Bible, Sonatas and Partitas. I wouldn't swap which, uh, it was. No, 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 but I, I, I think we, we're quite happy with six of those. And I think you, you're quite happy with... So, but you you meant to write that book before the pandemic, or how, how did it come about? More, actually, I wanted to make a film about the Bach Suites. Ah. Using some of the ideas, and then that doesn't seem to be happening. This doesn't happen yet. Um, so then I was I was just practicing the bus suites for pleasure during the first lockdown. I thought I must get back to these. I haven't played them for some time. And then it, so I don't know, just sitting there, I thought I read about these pieces all the time and read everything I can. Maybe I should write a book. And then my friend at Faber's was very enthusiastic about the idea. So. That's I started doing it. Great. And now I'm waiting for the proofs to come in. So it's basically finished. A few little... It's basically ready. And and it will be in real form or in online form? No, yeah, I, in real form. Probably, yeah. I mean, I'm sure it'll be in Kindle as well, but I don't know about yeah. it. I prefer books. Yeah, these days, I think we talked about it at some on, on some of our walks, but the ones I like sometimes are audiobooks, and it would be interesting for you to narrate it. Well, and maybe do some that one because it's so detailed, and you'd have to have music examples and things. Like yeah, that. who yeah. knows? That could be that could be an interesting project because you certainly can provide any 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 music yeah. examples that they. Sure, they... And, uh, maybe I'd love my children's books to be on audio book because. I yeah, think... how many have you written? Talk two. about it. For... I've written two books. For two children, a long time ago, and then one book of advice with a co-author called Robert Schumann. We wrote advice uh -huh. to young musicians. But that's different. That's not children. That's young musicians. Um, yes. Two books for children. Why Beethoven threw the stew and why Handel waggled his wig. And, uh, oh, yeah, wonderful. My son, really. But, uh, they're, no, they're great. They're nice. Now, tell me, let's go back because we met when you were still very young and you're still young of course it's hard and uh but we've got well, yeah compared to me in any case yes and we've got a lot a lot of gray just to look more distinguished but it at heart we're still little kids um but before i met you talk about your background talk about your grandfather and the, the whole sort of musical line in your family where you came from and how were uh, how did, did music play such an important role early on? Well, my grandfather was a, a fairly a, a famous Russian pianist and composer. But I mean, he composed small pieces. They're beautiful. Um, a friend of mine has made a disc of them. Um, but he was mm -hmm. mostly known as a pianist. And he was Russian. He studied piano with Safonov. But he also oh, wow. studied composition with Tanev. Wow. And this would have been, Taniev was Tchaikovsky's favorite student and great friend. Of course. And um, so my grandfather would have been studying with Taniev maybe 15 years after Tchaikovsky died or something or, or less. No, actually, probably less. 
So, I mean, the stories you must have heard about Tchaikovsky, I wish I'd known my grandfather better. I was, yeah. I was nine and he was always very ill when I remember him. But, um, yeah, so that's amazing. And he knew sort of Rachmaninoff, I think, and Skriabin. He played for Skriabin. In fact, Skriabin arranged his only tour of America. It turned out to be his only tour of America. Really? Skriabin wrote a letter recommending him. Oh, and wonderful. so he was, and then my father, my grandfather was born in Kishinev. Then he uh -huh. studied, became, I think, the youngest ever gold medalist at the, at the conservatory um, in Moscow. Fantastic. And Vladimir Ashkenazi told me there's a student who used to stand by the notice board with all the gold medalists and everything. What a strange name, Isolis. Where does that come from? <laughs> and, um, <laughs> anyway, and then, so my grandfather moved to, met my grandmother in Odessa. She came from a well-to-do Jewish family who had their own summer concerts, including their own orchestra, I think. And oh, I I guess. There was a little boy, Kusevitsky, my grandmother, remember him playing a Mozart violin concerto on the double bass, so it was stunning. And Heifetz <laughs> played and sounded and looked like he was an angel, she said. And my grandfather played there, and somehow, you know, he and my grandmother fell in love. So my father was born in Odessa in 1917, not the wow. best year to choose for him to be born in Odessa, but and then they moved to Moscow, where my grandfather became professor, and he toured around Russia with Anatoly Brandukov, who was the dedicated oh, yes. of the Rachmaninoff Sonata, and they used to play the Rachmaninoff Sonata together. Um, anyway, but then in 1922, Lenin gave permission, or rather ordered. 12 Soviet musicians to tour abroad for six months with your families, show the world what a cultural oasis the Soviet Union is, which was a great idea, except that not yeah. one of the 12 ever went back. <laughs> um, so, and then they, he was going to go to America again, but then he settled in Vienna, because he gave successful concerts there. Um, do, you, do you know who were the others? Maybe Shalyapin might have been another one. I've wondered that. I really, at that time. I think been. so, but I could, could be wrong with that. I believe that. Yeah, true. because Horowitz and Petigorsky, they, they left young. later. Yeah, they, were young. Two, they, they were younger. Yeah, but that's interesting. Shalyapin could have been, could have been at that mm -hmm. time, 22. And Kusivitsky probably was already in Paris because he was, he, he was very active even uh, before the revolution. Mm -hmm. You know, he went, he, he's one of the least uh you know every, every musician knows him or should know him because he was an incredibly an incredible catalyst mm. in russian culture yeah. Yeah. in french because he's the one who who did Cezanne ruse yeah. you know uh in, in in paris he commissioned uh, uh ravel the orchestration for the pictures Wow. He gave him the score, the piano score, and everything, and many other things. And, and in the meantime, he got a position in Boston. Yeah. And for a while, he did both Paris and Boston. And Boston was known to have many uh, French musicians mm -hmm. in there among the uh, principal players. Including and so and eventually he went, he went there. And then, of course, he built wood and taught Leonard Bernstein and was a great, uh, also, he commissioned some of the biggest Incredible. pieces you know, in the 30s 40s you know Bartok concerto for orchestra in britain and i mean an incredible catalyst of three major cultures yeah. you know music culture russian french and america so yeah. i'm sure he was probably already but the fact that you uh, your uh you know your grandma heard him play mozart concerto that's that's extraordinary Absolutely. on the double bass <laughs> And one of his, I think maybe his lead, or one of the second violins, I think, was Charles Martin Loeffler, who wrote some wonderful music and is the dedicatee oh, yeah. of one of my two favorite 20th century cello sonatas, Second Foray Sonata. And that's dedicated second to Loeffler, who was in the Boston yeah, Symphony. Yeah, a very good composer, wonderful. Yes, yes. Loeffler, exactly. There was a big, big French Boston connection yeah. for some reason. Yeah, this in in particular. Incredible, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's a wonderful story, and that's how you ended up. Uh, well, well, your father was so still born. Grandfather in was Then they all, all the Russian musicians used to visit them in Vienna. My father remembered 
sort of Joseph Hoffman coming to practice in the place and um, Levine as well. He, they both came to visit my grandmother oh, yeah. and even had to practice there. And Milstein used to come for dinner every time he was in Vienna and so on. So, no, but of course, then well, 1938 came. And, oh, yeah. Um, so it just so happened that my grandfather had been invited for his first tour in England the week after the Anschluss. So he came and of course he stayed and, but it took months to get my father and my grandmother here. So it must've been a very tense few months during which some very rich lady fell in love with my grandfather and his agent here said, oh, divorce your wife, she'll be fine in Vienna, marry this woman and she'll make a great career for you. I'm glad to say my grandfather ignored the advice and moved it agents. Yeah, but it was also very, very, very lucky in many ways that he was able to get them from yeah, at that time. And then, of course, so my father had to go to the internment camp in the Isle of Man, where he shared a room with Peter Shedloff and Norbert Reiner. Really? And they arranged the Mendelssohn concerto for, because my father was a very keen amateur violinist. They arranged, they did a version of it for two violins and viola for my father. And they used to play it together in the Isle of Man. Oh, yes. History there. A sad thing. Well, I remember visiting my grandmother in her old people's home. It's a very sad old people's home in Hampstead. And one day, I still remember, she reached up into her cupboard. And these incredible letters from Kazals, who my grandfather loved. He wrote a piece for him. And Rachmaninoff and I think Glazunov and people. They were all there. And after she, I guess they just got thrown away by mistake after she died. They're all gone. Oh, so sad. So that is really, you told I mean, me that story i told you the tour, story about prokofiev telling my grandfather a rather rude story and you told me what the russian word was and i always forget it i must write it down you know, <laughs> oh, do you remember the story my <laughs> yeah, sorry Macadamia yeah, if, it, just if it's it. with a rude word is uh, we, we'll probably do it after <laughs> after the program i know <laughs> Russian word. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, I also told you about the, the Prokofiev story with when he first came to uh, Odessa as a visiting uh, composer. He was he, he was being wooed by by the Soviets to come back because he left. Uh, you know, he left Russia in 1918, right after Kus uh, not Kusivitsky. Now that we've talked about Kusivitsky, but Lunacharsky, rather the Commissar of the Arts. He was talking to. Uh, Mayakovsky, uh, Prokofiev was there at a certain gathering and said, we create re revolution in politics, you create revolutionary poetry, and you write revolutionary music, right? At which point Prokofiev asked for his, uh, for the permission to go to America for a while. And you know, he always kept the Soviet passport. He never lost it in all the years until he came back to settle in, in 1935. Not a great move on his part. Not a great, but you know, considering what he wrote when he was back, that 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 may be compensated. But he was he was on a big tour and came to all the big uh you know cities, including Odessa. And Stolarsky uh, wanted, of course, to demonstrate his, you know, to, to, to show off his best student. So that best student played his first violin concerto, at which, at which point uh, uh, Prokofiev at the end said, young man, you're playing it all wrong. He jumped on stage and started giving him a lesson and everything. And that, that was it. And then he forgot about it. When he settled back, became good friends with David Oyster. Uh, Oyster asked him, said, uh, uh, Sergei Sergeyevich, do you remember that visit? said, yes, I remember. Oh, he played totally wrong. said, that was me. <laughs> That's <a> similar, story. <laughs> similar story, not a similar story, but my grandfather was, was touring also Russia. And he gave a concert and a friend of his who was a piano teacher in, in the town, so invited him to dinner afterwards. My gosh, it was so hospitable. And he said, look, I got a student I think is quite talented. Would you mind listening to him after dinner? Okay. You know, and the boy sat down, played Metna Sonata. And Metna was a great friend of my grandfather's. And oh, really? um, after he played, my grandfather turned to the teacher and said, no, I'm sorry, your, your boy is not talented. He's a genius. And that was Horowitz. <laughs> That's not bad. That's <laughs> pretty <laughs> good. <laughs> That's, I'm that's distracted here by macadamia the cat my son's cat yeah. <laughs> staring at me 
<laughs> very intensely. Anyway, yes. yes. So, oh, the Russian. I love all these Russian connections. Yeah, there are well, lots of it. First, I can't remember. You did something for the first time. Some Russian musician hadn't done before. And going back to oh. or something. Yeah, yeah. I went. I went back to uh, to to Soviet. Uh, well. To what still was Soviet Union as the first emigre. Yeah, that was a yeah. most memorable trip in December 88. Yes, and my mom came along and we, we did yeah. a number of, number of concerts. It was almost like a festival. It was something you don't forget because, first of all, when I was leaving, I never thought I'd see anybody again yeah. from my family, you know, and all my friends. And then only 11 years later, but so, so, so many things happened. And yeah. uh, then soon after that, I think Valodia came Ashkenazi, and then a year later came uh, Slava. Which was, of course, no, that not been after Soviet time. But... Yeah, yeah, it was. Yeah, and then, 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 of course, and now it's so many changes. <laughs> it's yeah. better if we, yeah, just just talk about culture because cultural heritage. This is something that we we managed to smuggle inside <laughs> because nothing was allowed. I couldn't take my violin or anything. Even if I, I came out with a bow, oh. uh, Georg Kurtnagel, the old um, uh, manager who never we never worked together, but he he knew my uncle, he knew the family. He smuggled a bow and met me in Vienna and gave me a bow. Okay. But I came out with a like factory violin, none, none of this. I mean, my violin was smuggled two years later by the Borodin Quartet. Oh, wow. The second violinist played it all the way. Uh, through the tour, and uh, then I, I came to see them in New York, and he said, "I will, as long as I live, I will never uh, uh, forget how you came to see your violin." In two years, I hadn't seen it. it was Andrea Granier? Is that you kissed it, and then you put a, you played a few more notes, and it just you know it sounded like that was the love affair that ever was, and and then I so came to it. <laughs> oh, I, I recognize the, the owner. Anyway, there, there were many, many uh, extraordinary, because of all the, you know, the wall and the whole, the, 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 you know, the music, of course, that was born out of this extraordinary political upheavals uh, was the great beneficiary, yeah, of it, because, you know, Prokofiev and Shostakovich, and, you know, if you look at the, at the, uh, output uh, or the influence, you know. Th these days, of course, everything has to to relate to 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 sport. <laughs> but if you make a team, if you make a team of the great Russian composers of the 20th century only, that would be hard to beat by any other culture, yeah. by any other team. You know, you you know, you'd have to have Rachmaninoff, yeah. you know, Metner. Uh, Prokofiev, Shostakovich, then of course Khachaturian, if you consider, but he was a Soviet, he was right. And then you have Shedrin, you have Schnitke, you have Denisov, you have Gubaidur, and so on and so forth. That's a very impressive, impressive, impressive number. And, uh, yeah. you know, if we, talk, if we talk about somebody like Kusivitsky, how he influenced, you know, there, there were other people who, who were also, you know. But I wanted to ask you now, uh, going back to your roots. So you obviously didn't have much of a choice but to become a musician because you were surrounded by your yeah. mother's side. Yeah, because my you talked about side obviously have, and also we have sort of vague connections to Mendelssohn and Karl Marx oh. and Helene Rubinstein. Um, wow. and my mother's side, it was also all her parents, my grandmother on was the most tone deaf person I think I've ever known, just about. Yeah. Um, my mother's father, whom I didn't really know, he liked music, but she studied piano in Geneva. And we have uh -huh. are also descended some from Lewandowski, great Jewish composer. And my mother sort of didn't really make it as a piano, she taught piano, she was a piano teacher. But I think, you know, if you get a slightly frustrated Jewish mother, <laughs> um, it sort of propels you into music, I think. And my sisters are both musicians. Annette's a violist, Rachel's a violinist. So, yeah, so our dog used to sing so beautifully. Um, so it was a musical family, yeah. 
Wonderful. And the choice of a cello in particular, uh, was it sort of your choice, your parents? How Rachel, did that happen? My sister Rachel was already playing the violin. I think they knew Annette, although Annette was playing the piano when I was when I was a little boy, but I think they knew already she would play the viola. So the cello uh -huh. was needed. And, you know, we, as a family, we used to play piano quintets. My parents of course. My on the piano, my father first violin, Rachel second, and the viola in here which wasn't the greatest success in the world. Uh, slightly dysfunctional, but, you know, it was a good thing we could do it. And music was just in the family. It still is, you know, Annette and, and Rachel and I, we know all the same people because because we move, all move in the music world. And it keeps the family very, very close to be, all to be doing the same thing. And we have very similar taste. We studied, you know, we had the same influences pretty much. And um, so, yeah. So you never you never contemplated becoming anyone else except professional musician. That was Pretty sort of much. predestined. And that well, unless unless we failed, yes. I mean, you know, which was a question. Oh, well, that, that was all that possibility, but you know, but in your case, I don't think um, that was sort of okay, that, that was in the cards. But I mean, you know, I wasn't. I didn't really. Yeah, but it, my career didn't start to take off really till I was at least thirty. So, I really, you you think that late? Yeah, I would say so. But uh, when we met, now let me think, because we met late eighties, right? Or somewhere. Well, I moved so to London. I was born at the end so of eighty yeah. oh, seven. Yeah. I was in my very late twenties. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So uh, I was for me, when you, I was... your, when you conducted your first concert, I was in the audience. Correct. It was thirty. Now it will be thirty-one years ago. Unbelievable. Oh, yeah. You were there. Yes. 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 <laughs> but I remember your first appearance at that festival and you played with Oli, I think must have been 88, Mustanen. a couple of years before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, with Oli Mustanen. And it was just something quite unique, revelatory. There was there was a freshness and vitality of <laughs> I remember that again. I remember you were really, really nice about it. I thought I played like a pig. No, but I meant it. <laughs> I was really, really taken by it, uh, by that whole, because, you know, I grew up, obviously, among the the the, the, the pretty good cellists, you know, the rest of Pobi, Shafran, of course. Shafran used to be our, uh, you know, absolutely. He used to come and play with my mother, Sonatas, really? when I was like, Really little kid. Oh yeah, and I remember he's. Oh yeah, yeah. They played for 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 a little. But he was a neighbor. Literally, he lived on the same floor uh, with us for for a number of years until he moved to the uh, same uh, apartment building where everybody else lived. You know, because and uh, very close to place. Country. It was out in the sticks. I it was a very small. Oh place. really? He moved yeah. again. I mean, he oh, just yeah. died. That was lit. But it was just just a few months after he died, and I went to visit his widow, yeah. and Svetlana, and his daughter, and his granddaughter, and we had a lovely time. I, I really liked him. Um, but it, I remember just this, God, you know, the successful musicians in the West had these huge houses and things. And Shafran, my houses and hero, was living in this little apartment. In a house but I remember. Well, of course, how, how, how could one forget his incredible, unique sound? I mean, the sound of the cello is just something. I, know. I bought it when I first heard it when I was about 11. Then I became obsessed. And then, you know, I took a little break, which was probably a good idea. Yeah. Because I was starting to imitate him much too much. And then I came back <laughs> to him. And I thought I wouldn't love him as much, but I do. I love him to this day. I love his playing. Yeah, and of course, I got to know him a little bit, a little bit later. Yeah. And I remember because, you know, little kids know just little details that his fingers were just full of band-aids, you know, the, because they like, practiced well, like incessantly. I mean, and then uh, later on, he became so mm, neurotic that he would just not answer any phone calls like a week mm. before the recital. And this, I mean, and then he would come out and be so incredibly nervous. I mean, it was just... A bundle of nerves, but in the in our house, in our apartment, it was not a house; it was an apartment, it's just on the same floor. And he would come in, and most glorious sounds, most glorious sounds. And yeah. unique. So it just didn't sound like anybody know, else. Yeah, that's absolutely absolutely true. But then you know, coming back to your debut in Costco in '88, it was just 
as something so and it, you know by that time they, we, we had a pretty pretty good collection of 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 cellist uh, prior to you was of course Misha Maisky and uh, and Boris Pergamenshka who we all loved Amazing. to pieces and Gary Hoffman who played beautifully yes. and uh, all also Gary Geringas and Marty Rosi and Truls Merck when he was not yet yes. so well known I mean we had a pretty pretty good collection that Karina Georgian team and so forth so you know you stood out. You stood out because you you had your voice, you know, you had, and that that whole charisma and uh, a manner, style, all your own. So I, in my mind, you were famous since you were. <laughs> so he's, we he's enjoying that bit. <laughs> <laughs> in my mind, you were a star since you were, uh, you know, early twenties. I never, you know, could. well, I had no career. I mean, virtually no career. No, I, you know, I wasn't star. Well, I yeah. probably was star. I need to be support, yeah. needed to be supported at least till my mid twenties. Interesting, oh, interesting. But that that was certainly not my percent. But anyway, let's let's see now. Uh, of course, you've been, of course, teaching a lot because what else can we do? You know, when we're stuck in, in the lockdown. But yeah, even oh, prior to that, yeah. maybe more than normal. Or, or about the same amount? No, because I, I mean, my main teaching has been Prussia Cove, which would have happened as a course both this year and last year. We could yeah. Have been Prussia Cove. So both times I did various lessons on Zoom last year. And yeah. this year I've actually done them you know, live, face to face, four days of class. That's so um, you... But apart from that, I haven't done that much. I've done the odd oh. class, but not, I think, no more than usual. And I've played some concerts, of course, not nearly as many. As usual, but the book I've, took a lot of time, and I practiced a lot. I like yeah, Great yeah, practice. that's that's wonderful. And and normally you 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 like practicing. You you enjoy practicing. Yeah, I do if it goes well. Yeah, um, I like music. So. I've I've learned how to practice probably after my last competition at, at the age of twenty five or something, and then I finally, you know, when there was already a lot of concerts and not enough time to practice then i finally learned how to appreciate those those hours in quiet and just slowly and the, you know and the and the just putting together a new piece you know it was almost an equivalent i felt because just putting a fingerings or boings for convenience is not what i would do for me that's already interpretation so you know i would have the score and this i i, I love that process and that should not be rushed you know? no, it and, be rushed. no it cannot because that you basically already designing your future interpretation with with your with your I spend, I, when i first learned piece and also when i come back to piece, i'll spend hours at the piano looking exactly and, um, just you play well the piano That's terrible Terrible, yeah. Um, I mean, sort of great. I agree, but I love it. I love it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I can, you know, I can pick out, um, well, not from a whole orchestral score, but a piano part. You know, I can get to know the piece. I can see which themes are which and what's happening to them. You know, it's essential. Yeah. Um, and then I go to the cello, and, as you say, put in fingerings and bowings, but only when I know how, how I want to play the piece, basically. <laughs> now, I have a interesting... Uh, question here just on 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 youtube uh, what are your two favorite fictional stories <laughs> you mean about anything not about music fictional. no no just about anything yeah fictional um, stories. oh god well i love Vic victorian novels i just uh -huh. love charles dickens and wilkie collins and anthony trollope and i don't know if i had to choose two books That'd be very difficult. It's difficult. Yeah. One, maybe one by a living author would be um, a fine balance by Rohinton Mystery, which I think is just a masterpiece. But that's almost like a Victorian novel, except set in 20th century India. Um, and then one book, I don't know, I, for Desert Island Discs, I chose The Complete Trollope. But I think the book I found hardest to put down was Armadale by Wilkie Collins, probably. Really, yeah. um, but on the hand, I couldn't live without David Copperfield and exactly you know, hmm, and Bleak House, exactly. and the way we live now by Trollope. And anyway, so yeah. my tastes are very old fashioned, but um, yeah, yeah, unusual books as lots. I don't want to keep coming back to in my mind, it's very unknown. 
my her, her son's wife by Dorothy Canfield, who is American. And a wonderful book. I mean, I just keep thinking about it, although I read it five years ago. So, anyway, yeah. Wonderful. But you, you don't read so much, of course, and would be in translation of, of, the, of the Russian of, of, uh, authors of, of the 20th well, century. Of Tolstoy and Tolstoy and Turgenev. Of course. Yeah, but 20th um, century. Bulgakov? No. Yeah, I've read Master Margarita. Yeah. Um, Dog's yeah. Heart? Nope, never read that. No, oh, that's a um, great, great novel. Yes, and Nabokov, I have. Yeah. He's a bit too clever for me, I think. Really? Um, yes, I've just, I mean, an incredible <laughs> writer. But I just, you know, I sort of get, I read, well, I felt so stupid. I read his book, Pale Fire, and realized at the end that I completely missed the point of the whole thing. <laughs> I was so annoyed <laughs> with myself. So I haven't gone back to him since then. Um, the only, the I, only I, I tend to read more books in English language because it's frustrating, I think, to read things in translation, no matter how good you translate. I mean, Proust, I did get through the whole. Proust, you know, um, but I was very yeah. was reading in translation the whole time. Interesting. Another one. Um, oh, that's interesting. Does Stephen ever get frustrated practicing? And what does he do when he does? Either stop um, <laughs> and take a break. I do, yes, I do often get frustrated. I was a bit frustrated today because my cello wasn't speaking properly. Um, really? Which happens. Somehow, a lot of people have that problem at the moment. It's something to do with the weather constantly changing, I think. Um, but you just sort of, if you're playing slowly and carefully, it's difficult to get frustrated because, you know, you're not sort of challenging yourself. If you play through too much, then you can get frustrated because it doesn't get better. Then you have to stop and fix what's wrong and just, you know, yeah. pinpoint, diagnose what's wrong and go and just try and, um, just try and fix it. But yeah, I mean, of course, some days are better than others. Yesterday, I really enjoyed practicing. Today, I haven't enjoyed so much. But um, but so what? Hopefully exactly. Do you always play your, your best cello, or you have several? You you change sometimes. Well, normally I play the for concerts. I play the Marcus de Coburn Stradivarius, yeah. but only when I'm playing things on gut strings, which of course is eighty ninety percent of the time. But if I want to play a concert on steel strings, then I play my own cello because the Strad, unfortunately for me, belongs, but they're very kind to lend it to me, belongs to the Royal Academy of Music. And yeah. they've lent it to me for a few years and I told them it's, they've lent it to me for life. And they said, no, 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 just for a certain number of years. I said, no, because if you take it away from me, I'm going to kill myself, therefore, <laughs> for life. <laughs> That's a good um, one. <laughs> but on steel strings, yeah, I play the Montignano. Like if I play oh, yeah. which concerto or Prokofiev concerto, oh, concerto was fifty-eight or Dutilleux concerto, something like that. Then I'll play. And then I have a cello made. I have actually two cellos. I was given by lovely makers. One, of a man who just started making um, cellos for his grandson who was studying the cello. He started making a cello. <laughs> Very good, Clive Morris. Good. And then my friend Robert Brewer Young has made a, a copy of the of Mr. Coburn. And if I have outdoor concerts, for instance, I've done it now, or I played it in Maldives. When I went to the Maldives, I took that cello and I played it on the sandbank in the Maldives at sunset, which was great for me and great visually, but not great for the cello. But Robert's cello seemed fine with it. So, yeah. Yeah. That's good. Tell me a little bit more about how did you first connected with uh, with uh, Prashakov because well, I've never been there so never been to, to there. describe to me yeah. beautiful place as in the world I first went there when I was 16 as a student uh, uh -huh. with a man John the Greg was there yes it was his course he started the whole thing he was there I started with Tibor de Markula who was quite an interesting Hungarian cellist with a slightly dodgy past mm -hmm. he'd been first cellist to the Berlin Philharmonic throughout the Second World War so. But he was oh, you know, very charming, nevertheless. But vague, of course, vague is the reason to go there, really, because his teaching was just wonderful when he was in a good mood. He could be horrible, just be absolutely horrible. Um, but boy, he had a lot to say musically. I mean, you can, I don't know if you know his recordings where he conducts Schubert symphonies. And those are among my oh, yeah. favorite recordings of all time. You know, wonderful. 
he was just a great musician. He made the music live. Absolutely. And so I went there and I was quite a success that year. Then I went back and I was, again, they were very nice to me. And then I went back and I went to the States to Oberlin College for a couple of years. And I came back and I went to open show music. Oh, you did? I went to play chain music there and I was a disaster and I was banned for three years. <laughs> <clears throat> I didn't behave my brilliant best, shall we say. It was all <laughs> Nigel Kennedy's fault. He tempted me into of a yeah, yeah, yeah. arcade, of course, into a, and we got and we missed the bus back and there was great ructions. And, anyway, so I was banned for a few years and I had to go back as a student. Okay. And then I started to go a lot and then eventually I started taking over the classes, I mean, started to teach there, and then I became director when Veig resigned. Veig hadn't been for some years. But Which has already been how long? Uh, 25 years. How long have you been? Yeah, 25, 25 years. years. Yeah. It's a long-term, long-term part-time job, because of course it's not, it's not. <laughs> it's part-time, yeah, yeah. it's a lot of time, and I care a lot about it. I, yeah, of I course, of course. Of course, I love the place, my parents are buried there, and everything. That's wonderful. Gorgeous. Yeah. And, uh, I'm in love with How the far is right? Hmm? How far is it from London, door to door from, from your house? Hours, over six hours, which is great because, wow. you know, we really go down there. It's like Hogwarts. We just sort of isolate yeah, it is. every meal together, every lunch, dinner together. You know, we really talk about music and get inside the music. There's no, yeah. no mention of careers. And I can't stand that emphasis today on you know you've got to get your instagram account right you've got to get your twitter that's all people seem to talk about but there we talk about phrasing and we talk about structure of the music and what the composers yeah. have in mind and you know it's all very different teachers teaching they're all very different from each other but we have certain common values so, like Gerhard Schultz and which is know, which is so, so important today and they these days, of course, when they talk about, oh, this one is an Instagram sensation, or this, oh, whatever that means. I mean, what, 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 how do you, how do you, what does it have to do with with music? And if you if you look at it, and then it's, they, you don't think they're serious. But anyway, there was a question actually related to this whole thing. Um, what's the best way for the young performers to be heard and noticed today? Is it still competitions, auditions? Now more online material like website, YouTube, and so forth. Well, yeah, of course, one has to be practical. You can't just say, think of the music and it'll all come, because it won't. Yeah. Um, yeah. My particular path was more through other musicians than anything else. You know, like mm -hmm. I'm friends with Oli Mustanen, who probably told you about me. And he also Absolutely. told Justin Parrott, which is my first really good agency. He got me in there. And then Joshua Bell recommended me here and there. I, mean, I still play with those, both of those. God, I've done, God knows how many years, over 30 years. Um, yeah. We've just been friends, you know, they're among my best friends as well. And that was my path, but competitions I hate, and I never won a big one. I won a little one, which gave me various concerts at £35 a concert, mm -hmm. which today wouldn't be would buy you a couple of dinners. <laughs> um, but you never entered big ones either. You, um, never, you never participated. No. You, you what never entered. Was I was in a, not a major one, but a fairly public one. The Leeds Scanner Competition for a bit had something they called a national music platform. So I went in for that. It was public the first round. I was knocked out in the first round. <laughs> and after that, two things happened. I never did another competition. And the Fanny Waterman, who was running the competition, scrapped it. Oh, she was so annoyed. So I was, oh, she scrapped the whole program. Yeah. Oh, I see. Yeah. <laughs> well, the whole thing was so ridiculous, and not just me being knocked out. Um, yes, because there were four cellists on the jury, none of whom liked my playing, because I hadn't studied with them, and I didn't oh. play in a way they liked or approved of. So, um, <laughs> so anyway, so I mean, it was good. It didn't feel good at the time, but um yeah it, in retrospect it was good it Close that a lot of competition yeah. player i mean i'm amazed my the for instance tchaikovsky competitions latimer fung just won in fact the members of the jury <laughs> started texting me when when it happened i couldn't believe it he's not a competition player either so he studied um, hmm? yeah 
He studied with you. He, yeah, a little he, bit, yeah. Studied. I'm just very fond of him. A little bit. You know, he's really, his heart is course, in, right. mind, in the right place. And Radu Lupu, you know, he won a big competition, two big competitions. And so exactly. You know, great players can Le- come through competitions, is my point. Um, but I don't agree with them, I refuse. In fact, unfortunately, that was my very last contact with Shafran. He wanted me to be on the jury of the Tchaikovsky competition, of which he was then chairman. And I said, no, I really didn't want to. He was quite offended, I think. And unfortunately, I'm not sure we ever um, did. Um, um, interesting, because he never really won uh, any competition except Soviet Union, which was, of course, course incredibly he, difficult. He joined first with Rostovovich and Prague. Oh, joint, yeah, 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 um, yeah joint for, exactly. And then maybe, maybe in, 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 in Czechia, uh, maybe in Prague, I think he won, maybe yeah, in Prague, the Prague okay. competition. That's and at yeah, 14, yeah. he won a big competition. But yeah, I mean, how do you right. get noticed? I mean, yes, of course, have a nice website. But actually, Jasper Parrott, who was my agent for some time, he gave me a good piece of advice. Right. Telling him about my idea of a chamber music series or concert series. And he said, you know, I think this is this is your path forward. Uh, your this is going to be the making of you that you have all these ideas for programs. And I think in a way he was right because then I went to Wigmore Hall, of course, endlessly, and Salzburg Festival in New York and places, and they liked my programs because I was, you know, I love to read about composers, so I know quite a lot about what repertoire is there is chamber music and orchestral even. Um, and so I could do these programs, and my friends like Ollie and Josh. Stephen Huff and various people would, would all t- come and take part. And so the, you know, the series are quite successful and then you start to make a name. But I think everybody has their own different path uh, is the main thing. Don't try right. to be like him And don't... No, no, no. But, but I, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I think it also is very important to be able to uh, have an access to a big personality to a successful artist in order to ask questions, observe, yeah. uh, you know, just, you know, apprenticeship, which happens only, I think, with conductors. Uh, you know, one of my good friends and also somebody who was on this program, Tony Papano, he spent five or six years with Byron Boyd, learning, of course, not only the scores, but also about the business of music and how, you know, and could ask, could ask him any kind of questions, yeah. you know, uh, okay. along the way. That access is very hard to find among the instrumentalists, isn't it? Once yeah. you stop, uh, you know, once you graduate from the school. Well, I think you do that through chamber music, I think. I mean, I think it's incredibly important. For yeah. You. you know, there was, when I was growing up, there was a school of thought thought we shouldn't play chamber music, actually in Russia as well because that was unbecoming for a soloist. And that's just such rubbish. I think more the opposite might be true. That it's unbecoming for a chamber music player to play solo, but neither is true. Because <laughs> concert is a chamber music too. And, you know, I've, first of all, you know, if you're talking career-wise, probably my career has blossomed through playing chamber music with really good people. But, um, but also just musically, you know, that's, you just get so much from playing with people. And, Absolutely. I'm a pain in the neck. I know I am in chamber music rehearsals, but I know I give people a hard time. And if they like it, <laughs> they like it. And, yes, and if they don't, don't yeah, again. Um, yeah. But also me, I learned so much from playing with Chandel Vig, although he was horrible to me sometimes. But boy, I learned a lot. Was he really? Oh, he could be awful. <laughs> there was one occasion that was actually not the most awful, but there was an occasion, famous occasion in Prussia Cove where he... I was talking to, I think, Melissa Phelps, the cellist, who talked from the table. Suddenly I was drenched. Oh, yeah. My hair was drenched. And I looked, and there was Vague with an empty beer glass. And he'd just thrown the whole content all over my head. I think maybe he'd wow. been imitating him. It didn't go down. <laughs> um, anyway, but, yeah, we didn't get on brilliantly personally all the time. But you know, yeah. I appreciated him musically, and I think he appreciated me too, that he kept getting at me and... Yeah. I learned so much from him. And then, you know, I still play via Zoom or over the phone or whatever to Kurtag. I work a lot with him and he coaches me on his pieces. And I'm longing for him to say more and more about every note, which he, he's capable of doing. It's wonderful. And Ferenc Radosh, I play with a lot. He's Andros Schiff's teacher. 
and I've learned right. a lot from him. And yeah, and still, of course, I'm taking what I, my roots were. My first teacher, Jane Cowan, and she'd studied with Feuermann. She'd studied with Donald Tovey. You know, it's great, great pedigree. Yeah, that's wonderful. There is a, there's a question on online here, but I think I did ask you that. Uh, yeah, it just says even maybe this question already came up. Have any of you experienced any positive changes or advantages due to the pandemic? For example, concerning your everyday musical life. I think you partially answered yeah, that, but I've you've... enjoyed it. I mean, I've been okay so far. Touch wood. And you know, although I'm heavily in debt, I feel you know things are starting. But I'm really worried for the young musicians who are just starting to have opportunities. Yeah. And now you know, there's other young musicians would have got the same opportunities. I don't know which ones are going to get them. Yeah, I mean, it's basically it's going to be a two-year hiatus in a lot of people's careers, and that's that's worrying. My heart goes out to them. It's very uh, worrying. It's heartening, you know. Yeah, it's very, it's very difficult because you know, uh, in my case, it's been very productive because I just re, reprogrammed myself before. I never spend more than three months a year in my house, but this time, I spend the whole year in my house except for three short trips. And uh, as a result, I just did enormous amount of uh, transcriptions, which I would normally wouldn't have had as much time for, and did a lot of things online, distant videos with my chamber orchestra and, the, you know, this program and the many, many interesting projects. So, so for me, the life in that respect, I can say that I've sort of, I've managed to beat the pandemic, at least on the creative side. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, uh, then when I go now on the road, it becomes just so we talked about it is so strewn with with, with unknown and uh, difficulties with all the tests, with all the quarantines, with all the uh, it's uh, ah, as I it said, feels great for the concerts. I've normally, felt. I mean, I gave a few in the autumn. I gave I did a tour with Thomas Addis of Germany in Germany, and then I gave a couple of concerts in Madrid in November. And then I've, through the pandemic, I've so far given three concerts at the Wigmore. No, four. That's right. No, more, actually. Four. Five concerts, I think. Because there was a time when you could have an audience for it. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I gave three recitals of Mishka Moment without audience. And I've got another one next month, I hope. Sorry, Wonderful. I can talk about that yet because it's not advertised. We'll see. Um, yeah. And then I gave two. And, well, I did my, which I, as another thing I enjoyed doing, I wrote a, uh, an evening of words and music around Proust and the actor Simon Callow read the words and did that. And I also did a recital earlier in the day also to do with Proust. That was, that was great fun. That was, and that was with a small audience. That was nice. And the, every, the, you know, they've become real events for me. For that, for Absolutely. Um, those things. And then I just made a film with the Dvorak concerto with the LPO. And yeah, so nice playing orchestra. I've done a couple of things with BBC Scottish. These are wonderful orchestra. They're so nice as well. Um, so yeah, it's the few experiences I've had have been quite positive. So that's nice. I mean, you know, just they really do feel like special. Have felt like special occasions. The Absolutely. Of also know. because, yeah, and and of course, you know, the audience and the musicians are so starved for mm. for making music. But there, there's one element, uh, I'm just curious how, because you've done a number of concerts with no audience. Mm -hmm. How is that? Uh, I mean, that is something... It doesn't really bother me that which, much. I mean, people say it must feel so weird. I said, no, because I'm used to playing in the Wigmore without audience when I rehearse. You know, it doesn't feel spooky or anything. And you know people are listening. Yeah. And there's always two people in the hall. Yeah. Uh, or three, including the page turner. Yeah, so there is, um, it's never completely empty. Yeah. 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 And it, was, it was fine with orchestra again, you know, with no audience, but the orchestra's there. And you want to play well for them. Um, so, yeah. so there is, yeah. What I, I haven't dared play anything. You're fine with it. No, I had to play something from memory yeah. for a live broadcast of the Schumann concerto for that. I found terrifying. But I always find memory terrifying. <laughs> um, but no, I mean, really? so back at the Wigmore. Yeah. Just a very special, 
special place and it's really yeah it's uh, Whitmore Hall is its reputation has just soared through the pandemic because John Gilhooley has made sure it's hardly yeah, it's sure. exactly. he's just gone for it and that's brilliant it's like Myra Hester during the Second World War here and he'll he'll you know the Whitmore Hall will be remembered for its for its sort of life-saving attitude during this oh, time. Okay. Fantastic. Fantastic. Another question. Uh, does Stephen have musicians he wants to work with that he hasn't? Mm. The ones that you missed. By Carlos Kleiber, Rachmaninoff. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Furt Wengler. Um, and the living. Yes, a few. I yeah, mean, yeah. That's one good thing about you know, being around for so long. I know a lot of the musicians I, I really admire. There's some conductors I know, or only work, hardly work with, or never work with. Her. Certainly, some I'd like to work with more. Um, and you know, people that I did, I got to play with Radu Lupu, who's probably well, one of my all-time favourite oh, players. Yeah. I got to play with him in his third, last, and last ever concerts. I just got there. Really? In time. <laughs> yeah, and I love Radu Lupu. Um, as a oh, man, rather, very special. Um, we played. Schumann Romances, Opus 94. Oh, At wow. my 60th birthday concert, we played it. That was the first time we played together in public. And then for his very last concert it was in Lucerne, we did the Schumann Romances Get Better, I must say. And I directed sort of the orchestra for him. He played Mozart K488, the A major, the great A major concerto. And that was his last concert. Yeah, of course. It was too much to yeah. well, think yeah. about. Um, but it was a great honor. Um, who else? I'm sure there are people I yeah. know that I'd like to. I mean, certainly some pianists, yeah. And, um, but I mean, I'm pretty fond of the of the people I do play with <laughs> regularly. I mean, you know, yeah, exactly. So uh, it's you know, Joshua, Joshua Bell, of course, Ozzy Muston and Jeremy Denk. These are my regulars. Tab Ed Zimmerman, I play with quite a lot. And um, now Josh and I are playing with Kissin, Yevgeny Kissin, whom I've never played with. Yeah, yeah. Uh huh. So that should be very interesting. And, yeah, you know, there are people. Oh, definitely. There's lots I want definitely. to do. Not time to retire or die yet. I hope. No, 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 no. Interestingly enough, you never, uh, with your clear, uh, you know, pre predisposition to teaching, because I, I remember I mentioned to you uh, once that I, I saw a fantastic masterclass you gave in the BA on the Beethoven Sonata. And uh, so you know that you, you know, obviously all the years in, in Prashakov where you work with musicians, and yet you never, you never taught sort of at any, any schools, any institutions. Okay. Is it uh, what I call when, when, when similar question is directed to me, I said, well, I, I kind of um, follow Groucho Marx. Mm -hmm. uh, you know <laughs> that I wouldn't want to be a member of the club that would have me as an as a member. Is it something similar to I you? Is it? Quite say that, unless I was being falsely <laughs> modest. Um, no, there's yeah. two reasons. One, that you know, I like you. I just travel all the time. So yeah, you know, when I come home, I spend some, have some free time. Exactly. Um, but secondly, I'm. I mean, I do think I can maybe give some helpful classes. I can talk about music endlessly. But if somebody, you know, week to week, that's a different sort of teacher. And I really respect the sort of people who can sort out their students' physical problems and, you know, just guide them from week to week. And I don't think I'd be very good at that. And yeah. also, I'm just too controlling, I have to say, because I have such strong views on these. I'd probably squash the poor students unless they were very, very strong. I think people are better off just having a few classes with me from time to time. Um, than you know week to week uh, as I say, and, that, and also as a teacher you really do have to have an understanding of how technique works and i don't really have that and i don't want it because i okay, I, don't want to know what it, it. I played absolutely naturally and i can't understand where yeah. i played the cello whereas i can't do anything else with my hands i'm hopeless my writing is horrible i can't draw anything nothing with my hands but playing the cello is just, really that's yeah, but with my hands. Obviously, you were born to play to play that particular instrument, and that's what well taught by a teacher. Uh, yeah, absolutely and, natural. And and that teacher was Jane Cowan. And yeah. without her, I think you know, it'd be very different. 
And again, people kept saying, oh, she's a terrible teacher, we've got to leave her. You know, I had that all the time from famous people whom I really respected. Really? It was very, you know, like, I loved Antonio Yanigo's playing. It was fantastic. But I went to study with him. And his, his first thing after I played to him, he said, well, it's difficult for me to say anything because everything his teacher has taught him is completely the opposite of what I'd say. You know, and then he put pressure on me to, to leave her and go and study with him. And I always did. And though I think he was wonderful cellist, fantastic. And I'm very fond of him as a man. Um, but I'm very glad I didn't. Sorry, it's my grandfather talk. Yeah, it's okay. That's good. Oh, yeah, it tells us it's, it's, it's um, part of it. close to it. He yeah. keeps attention once an hour. Um, yeah, yeah. And unlike me, it's once a minute. But yeah, I'm very glad I stayed with her. But it was, again, like Shafran, it was a very individual approach. But I still think her approach was very, very natural and organic. And it worked for me. It didn't work for everyone. Yeah. It worked. You know, people like Stephen Dome, for instance, she helped him so much. And, um, and now he's become a great teacher. He passes on a lot of what right. he learned from her as well, of course, his own thoughts. Um, yeah. So. And she just made music and technique the same thing, so I didn't have to think about technique. Yeah, of course, in those, you know, bygone uh, days of uh, the great years of Moscow Conservatory, which I remember, the 60s and 70s, I mean, you had an advantage of not only great teachers that taught you directly, I studied with Yankilevich and then later with Bisrodin and so on, but we could actually come and I I've done that many times, and uh, uh, sit in the class of Rostropovich, mm. you know, whose teaching talent was just as extraordinary. Some of his students think that he was maybe the the most gifted for teaching. I mean, his his lessons were just out of this world because he was always incredibly full of people. So it was was a performance in in many ways. It was a master class. He never never uh, played cello yeah, in his lessons. He played yeah. and made most extraordinary, uh, you know, images and this, and the fantasy was unbelievable. Mm. And uh, so we could go, you could go in here. And then there were phenomenal uh, piano teacher, Yakov Flier, Yakov Zak, who I learned a great, great deal. And also the violin teacher you could go and listen David Oistrich teaching when he was there, and you know, and all of them, and Kogan, and you know, those days, of course, if you were, I don't remember that that was the case at Juilliard, for instance, because I always went to Galaman's home, to his apartment, and there was nobody except one on one, you know, and which is also important. Some some lessons I remember I went to Yankilevich's home too, but his class was just for at least 30, 40 people all the time from all over the country, really. They, they did came people in. play chamber music there a lot? Was that not? Not a hell of a lot. And not, it, it, it began. There was an obligatory string quartet class, and I had a wonderful uh, 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 teacher in string quartet, actually at Juilliard, also members of the Juilliard Quartet. But uh, that was sort of obligatory, and there was a famous <laughs> scene when somebody like Gideon Kramer and uh, Misha Maisky would be standing uh, uh, looking at you know, who's coming in and said, listen, oh, would you play a string quartet examination with, with us in, 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 in an hour? We need to pass. You know, anybody who played the violin needed like a second violin or something. I mean, it's kind of, kind of silly or violas. But I remember I studied some wonderful uh, quartets, you know, Shostakovich Seven Quartet, which would play also in some concerts. Yeah, but not the, and of course, sonatas. Of course, sonatas. Sonatas, uh, there, there was a class of chamber music. But it's interesting because in the 30s, you know, uh, Oyster had a trio with Knushevitsky and Oboe. Yes. They played trios. I was just listening yeah. to it. You know, so it's not like, yeah, it, it was not completely. My father founded Tchaikovsky String Quartet with Barshai playing viola and Slabotkin mm -hmm. and, and Anton Sharoyev, who then you know, was the head of a Kiev Chamber Orchestra and still alive at the age of 100. Uh, and I think maybe a hundred and one. It's unbelievable. What I met him in, in the name? city. I mean, uh, Anton Sharoyev. Mm -hmm. Sharoyev. Yeah, Anton Sharoyev, he was second violinist to my father. Tchaikovsky String Quartet. 
in the mid 50s and they played you know uh, Schumann Quintet or Shostakovich Quintet with Richter you know and some of the I mean people did so it, it was I think the more competition race started mm -hmm. uh, a lot of you know string players and piano players they would just there was such a machine you remember in the in the in the 50s and 60s i mean if the soviet team came there was basically no chance for anybody else to win because of the preparation and the local competitions and it, it was a real sport like you know let me see uh yeah interesting oh interesting well sorry it's just it's just a comment yeah there was a couple more before i let you go um yeah what do you think uh how do you see the performing arts after the pandemic how do you think it will be is there a chance that maybe we learn some things i mean you talk about your brother, but in general the sort of the business of music do you see some changes some welcome changes some unwelcome oh, ones no. we we not we, we for me, for me it, yeah. was fine it was fine before um <laughs> i think maybe there'll be less touring because there'll be less money that's for and sure yeah. cost money um there might be less of that whether there will be shorter concerts without intervals i hope not i mean that didn't happen after the spanish flu which was much more of a, a pandemic um yeah i wonder i mean in the immediate future the positive thing is that everybody will be just delighted to get back to live music you know? like when i gave a concert in the fidelio cafe last summer I, that was again that was oh yeah idea i call it the wigmore hall of cafes it's wonderful and i gave the first concert there i played bach suites and people were there because they not only had they not heard live music they hadn't been out for dinner for you know, three months or something, and it was just such an atmosphere. And I hope we'll have a lot of that when people start to go back. And then I think things will start to slot back into normal mode. I would think. <laughs> who knows? I could be wrong. It could be. Yeah, but also hopefully because composers been composing more, uh, or as before, because I know a, a couple of uh, you know or composers that been. Uh, composing operas during because they were commissioned. Eleni Disatnikov, who, who was very much on my mind because I, I transcribed uh, his Bukovina preludes, but also Alexander Raskatov, who I met actually only online. And he did a program where he's, he's writing a, a major opera uh, of Animal Farm, Orwell's. Yeah. yeah, for the Amsterdam opera. So I'm just hoping that maybe we will have also maybe more uh interesting music written uh at this well, as a result yeah, of this it's funny i thought of it when you said that 20th century russia produced more you know, as much as i think actually i don't not very proud of a lot of what britain is doing at the moment but i think the composers we never had so many fantastic composers as we've got today exactly Wonderful. but that was true before the pandemic i mean there probably will be a yeah well, who told me yesterday he said he thinks streaming is here for good he thinks there's a great thing about it that you can have interviews, you can present the music, you can talk about it. He says it'll go alongside concert life much more than it used to. Maybe he's right. I don't know. Yeah. It's, it's, it's possible. And also smaller venues, you know, before it becomes, you know, again, more massive, uh, more numbers in big halls. But now, now venues that are beginning to start the chamber music uh, series where they don't depend so much on the numbers because yeah. so much uh, that was wrong in the in the music business was uh, as, as soon as it became the uh, the game of numbers then yeah. it immediately went off you know yeah so i know i think halls are sometimes yeah. much too big um i'm very happy yeah. in hall like i mean you know, one has to play in the big halls one, one does but still i love the sure. playing in a hall the size of the wigmore hall or even size of the Fidelio exactly Hall. right and even said, even there yeah, because you have that yeah and that exchange of energy that we we miss so much with the live audience it sometimes is not sometimes but often more intense in the smaller venue because right. you you literally and maybe talk new, about venues, it. You, new venues will spring up like my son gabriel he's he's got this this company that finds new venues for all sorts of all the arts you know tutti tutti dot space it's called 
one. But I mean, wonderful. Talk, I talk about it a little bit. Yeah. Amazing spaces in London. I didn't know it existed. Incredible. I mean, a whole 400 people, whatever. Um, you know, exactly. Maybe they'll start to come out. Who knows? I mean, we really don't know. We don't. We just pray that there's not a new strain that puts us back to square one. But if there isn't, well, let's hope we'll gradually get back to normal, amplified. <laughs> Amplified, yeah, with, with amplified emotions at least, okay, and, and the I desire. Excitement, I don't mean sound, exactly. I mean, you know, no, more, no, no, more no, no, because no. people will appreciate it more. We hope that's the that's the positive hope. Exactly. Well, that's a that's a great note to 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 wrap up. And thank you so much, Stephen. I hope we nice. we make more more talks on our walks. Okay. But in the meantime. Thank you so much for joining yeah, and, and making and of course and, and and see you on the corner of, of our two roads as we as we, as we often do. I'm now going to pour this water away because while we were talking, Macadamia the cat came and drank out of my water. So I think no no bounds. Oh she did. Oh god. <laughs>